Hello, I'm Howard Bentham and welcome to this special virtual event from Oxlep Business in partnership with Newable and the Department for International Trade. Our focus for the next 90 minutes or so is value added tax and how this is affected by the new trade rules and taxes that SMEs should be aware of now the UK's transition period has come to an end. The UK EU trade deal means businesses can no longer trade freely under the previous EU VAT and customs agreements and new taxes and rules apply. During this broadcast, we'll have input from some leading figures directly involved in managing the UK's transition and help give you a better understanding of what Oxford's businesses need to know about the EU exit and how this affects your VAT liabilities. Before I introduce our guest speakers, please allow me to deal with some parish notices, which should help the event run smoothly for everyone. Firstly, if you're watching this as a live event, we need to make sure that you can all see and hear my screen. If I can just ask you all to type the word yes into the question box on the drop down menu, that will tell us that you're all connected properly. Thank you. If you are having a tech problem, please post a private message into the chat space and someone from the Newable team will get straight back to you and try and help resolve the issue. Today's presentation is being recorded and a copy will be sent to you with the accompanying slides within the next 48 hours. We really want to make today's event as interactive as possible, so please feel free to add your comments and queries into the question panel. We'll try and answer as many of these during the broadcast as possible and we'll have a dedicated Q&A section at the close of the event. Naturally, there may be some questions that need some further research, but rest assured, we'll endeavor to provide an answer for you post-event. If you're watching this as a recording, there's always help on hand at Oxlep. Please contact the team via the website at oxfordshirelep.com forward slash UK dash transition. And finally, if you do not want your comment or question read out, please write private before submitting your point. Oxlep Business is determined to play a key role in ensuring that the county's businesses are able to run as efficiently as possible and remain productive both during the pandemic and as the UK embarks on this new chapter of life outside the European Union. It's therefore timely to mention that Oxlet Business's deadline for applications to its latest capital fund is closing later this week. The Business Investment Fund offers match grants of up to £100,000. Please do check out the Oxlet Business website for details on eligibility and how to apply. I'm sure you'll agree that today's guest speakers make for an impressive lineup of experts, each with a very clear area of specialist knowledge to help your business or organization navigate these unique circumstances we now find ourselves in. Towards the end of the event, we'll take a detailed look at what's changing as far as VAT is concerned when doing business with the EU, how this affects the movement of physical goods and whether your business needs an EU EORI number plus a raft of other important factors relating to your VAT obligations post UK transition. We'll hear from Alexandra Wyatt, Global Project Manager at Simply VAT, sharing her expert view on this, plus an overview of the VAT reforms coming our way in July. Newable's Angus Murray will give us an overview of the services offered by the Department for International Trade. Plus, we'll hear some great input from Jill Carr, who's an EU transition advisor at Newable. Today's event, alongside the wide-ranging support being made available, is the latest initiative to be launched by Oxlep, recognising our commitment to supporting the Oxfordshire business community at this critical time. Our first guest speaker will endorse that commitment. He's got over 35 years of experience in economic development, business management, strategy and policy development. He's run his own businesses, worked in the public and voluntary sectors, and advise businesses along with local and national government. He's a co-founder of Smart Oxford and part of the Smart Oxford Partnership Board. His current role at Oxlep, Head of Innovation and Inward Investment, involves leading the team and working alongside government and local partners to develop an international strategy and delivery plan for Oxfordshire, promoting the world-class innovation, assets and skills available in the county. With an overview on Oxlep services, Here's Sebastian Johnson. Thanks, Howard, and hello, everyone. As Howard said, I, I'm Sebastian Johnson. I head up the work we do at the Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership on 
innovation and international investment and trade in partnership with the uh, government's department for international trade and i wanted to give you a brief introduction to the work we do at uh, the local enterprise partnership we're a government funded agency responsible for the economic development and growth of Oxfordshire. and in the last few years we've overseen securing over 660 million pounds worth of investment in infrastructure in the county that's for transport improvements employment sites and innovation centers this investment itself has drawn down significant private sector investment alongside it. We've overseen the creation of nearly 50,000 new private sector jobs, and we're one of the fastest growing economies, one that's, one that's grown on average by almost 3.7% each year. And we're one of only three counties that's a net contributor to the Exchequer. We're responsible for strategy, business support and skills development, and we work in partnership with businesses, business groups, uh, universities, colleges, local authorities, and a range of other partners across all sectors, both nationally and locally. We promote Oxfordshire to international investors and work with our partners to encourage and support international trade. We're a hotbed for investment and talent. Can we move on a slide, please? And another as well, well please. Thanks. Our business support services range from mentoring, peer support, expert advice, access to youth facilities and grant pro grant programmes. And grant support and grants to start, run and grow your business. Most notably, the Innovation Support for Business programme, that's a one-to-one -one support for introducing innovation into your business. Got grants available of up to £50,000, requiring a times match for businesses who want to develop new and innovative ways to do business new procedures, new digital practices for running a business more effectively and developing new project, products and services. The Escalate project is offering scale up support for businesses. The uh, program offers grant funding of 1,000 to 25,000 pounds for startups, growth and scale up businesses. And as Howard mentioned, we've got a new fund that's opened this month called the Business Investment Fund. 2.1 million pounds of capital funding with grants from 25,000 to 100,000 pounds available per business with 50% match required. And an expression of interest is open for that program that closes on Friday at 5 pm. So please check our website for more details about that. And, and businesses focusing on areas including a push towards diversification into new markets, increasing uh, export capacity, uh, and, uh, and transitioning to global trading, these are the kind of businesses we're particularly interested in. Next slide, please. We all recognise the impact that COVID-19 has had on the, uh, on the country, the businesses, uh, and, and all of us as individuals. We've been partnered with, with local authorities, universities, business representative groups, uh, and businesses themselves. We've developed an economic recovery programme that gives us the strongest chance for a fast and successful bounce back from the economic hit of COVID-19. Alongside this already difficult time, we recognise that the end of the transition period with the EU may be throwing additional challenges at businesses around VAT as we're talking about today, but other things, employment uh, and IP, a whole range of issues. And so with support from the government's department for business, energy and industrial strategy, we've set up this EU transition business readiness support project to ensure that businesses can get the quick answers to the questions they may have and the challenges they are facing. And this is where I must confess that I'm, I'm the fraud in the room, if you like, I'm not the expert. But we have got some great, great experts lined up, as Howard said. So I'll shut up very soon uh, so you can hear from them. I hope you find this webinar helpful and informative, and whether listening live or listening to the recorded version on our website. If you've got any questions or need help, then please, please, please go to our website, oxfordshirelep.com, where you'll find loads of information about the work we do, the support that's available. I'll stop there and I'll pass back to Howard, but thanks for listening. Many thanks to Sebastian Johnson from Oxlep. Remember, if you do want to ask a question or make a specific point, then please use the question panel in the control area of this platform. We'll endeavour to answer as many of them in the Q&A section at the end of the broadcast. Oxlep, as we've just been hearing, is very much on hand to help. Today's broadcast is a collaboration between Oxlep, the Department for International Trade and Newable, who proudly states on their website that their values help foster a culture that generates business confidence. Like most things in life, as in business, confidence is absolutely key. Our next contributor works as an EU transition advisor in the Newable team, supporting and assisting businesses with their EU transition, providing advice and guidance based on the very latest government details and guidelines. She has extensive knowledge of all aspects of trading in Europe, Latin America and Russia, 
She has an international sales and marketing background, having spent 30 years working in a range of consumer goods companies, including Boots, Wedgwood, Tata Group, and Walt Disney. Most recently, she spent six years working as an international trade advisor for the Department for International Trade, supporting a broad range of SMEs in the Southeast region of the UK, having previously lived and worked in the USA, Peru, Panama, Mexico, Spain, and Sweden. For an overview on the services offered by the EU Transition Advisors at Newable, here's Jill Carr. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Howard has kindly pointed out, um, I have a, a broad commercial background as well as business advisory experience. Um, as he mentioned, I've worked in exports for 30 years for a variety of companies, mainly in the food and consumer goods industries, but also in other areas such as shipping and logistics. Um, I did work prior to doing this role, I did work as an international trade advisor for the D Department for International Trade for six years, working with a broad range of companies across every sector in the southeast of England. Uh, we were set up to access, uh, sorry, to support UK SMEs post transition out of the European Union, and we have access to all of the latest government details and guidelines. For example, we get daily briefings on things that have changed uh, and, and develop the latest developments. We have access to a, a, a network of government and industry specialists uh, through which we can access all sorts of information and advice, such as VAT that Alexandra is going to talk about today, uh, legal advice, logistics advice and e-commerce, all sorts of any topic you can think of we probably have somebody uh, who can talk to you about it. We're also networked in with the International Trade Advisors, um, which Angus will come on to talk about. Um, if you're not linked to a trade advisor, it would be worth your while getting linked in so that you can get access to government grants and all sorts of other advice that they can provide you with. Uh, we're here to help a business navigate specific uh, information needs that you have. So don't sit and suffer in silence. Um, get in touch with us, send us your questions through this webinar or afterwards, you'll, you'll have my details in a minute. Uh, we can help you develop action plans to ensure that you can confidently comply with all of the new rules and regulations in this new world that we find ourselves in. Uh, there are many grey areas, it isn't simple. So don't sit and battle on your own. Let us help you navigate the, the issues that you're coming up against. And finally, we can also help businesses take advantage of new opportunities that are coming up with new trade agreements, you know, with countries such as Japan, hopefully the US, Australia and, and a host of other countries. So again, myself or the international trade advisors can help you do this. E-commerce is another area that um, we have some experts on and we have um, the government have done deals with marketplaces around the world. So again, if that's your route to market, you know, come and talk to us and we can help you access them. Basically, we're here to help you and point you in the right direction to get solutions to your problems and answers to the issues you're facing. Um, we'll we'll pick up queries afterwards if if you're not if you have a question it's not answered in the Q and A again just get in touch and we'll pick them up on a one to one basis with you. So if I could have the next slide, please. Um, these are all my contact details. If you can just give us a little bit of information as to who you are and the nature of the query you have, obviously we can do a bit of research before we get back in touch with you. But we will get in touch if you'd like us to. Um, so don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Thank you very much. I'll pass back to Howard. Many thanks, Jill Carr from Newable. And thank you for watching this special virtual event from Oxlet Business, Newable and the Department for International Trade on what Oxfordshire's SMEs need to know about VAT when trading with the EU post-transition. Still to come, we'll hear from Alexandra Wyatt from Simply VAT on some of the practical considerations on taxes you need to be aware of when trading with the EU. But next, let's concentrate on international trade. So many questions right from the first mutterings of the referendum centred on how trade would look in our brave new world outside the EU. Many of the Brexit and Remain arguments of the time were matters of the heart as much as of the bottom line. 
So how is this new landscape for international trade beginning to take shape, coupled with the effects of the global pandemic? That's a very difficult question to answer. Our next contributor to our virtual event is an experienced international sales manager who's been advising and mentoring companies on developing businesses overseas for 10 years. Prior to joining the Department for International Trade, he spent a decade running the export departments of various multinational manufacturing companies in the creative industries, engineering and consumer goods sectors. His key territories included the EMEA and Americas region. He's fluent in Spanish and conversant in Portuguese, French and Italian and is passionate about UK exports with a wealth of practical experience in doing business and managing distribution channels. In addition to managing a team of international trade advisors, he's also the DIT Southeast's Latin America specialist and takes frequent trade missions to the region. For an overview of the services offered by the Department for International Trade, here's international trade advisor, Angus Murray. Hi, Angus. It looks like you're on mute. Uh, we still can't hear you. Uh, no, uh, sadly not. Um, Sorry about this, everyone. We're just trying to get Angus's microphone back on again. Um, Angus, I'm not sure if you maybe just want to come out and come back in. No, still nothing. Ah, oh, wait, do you want to try now? Yeah, how's that? Perfect, that's fantastic. Fabulous, thanks for stopping right. that, Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, apologies for that. Um, yeah, so uh, as, it, as the introduction from Howard uh, explained, I'm an international trade advisor with, with the Department for International Trade. Um, just like my colleague, Jill, um, I'm, I'm part of a, a network um, which includes 65 uh, international trade advisors right across um, London and Southeast region. Uh, just like Jill, come from a private sector background, so you know we can bring that that practical experience and knowledge to help companies with their putting their strategies and plans together for export. So we provide free impartial advice, and we can bring together sector specialists right across. Um, all sectors we cover, uh, we've got specific sector teams for consumer food and drink, fashion and e-commerce, creative and digital technology, advanced engineering, manufacturing, infrastructure, energy, professional and business services. Uh, alongside that, we've got specialists in um, various uh, strands of business like joint ventures, partnerships, licensing, marketing, uh, working within a, uh, international agents and distributors, et cetera, et cetera. So really we're about trying to create the export thinking and, and the strategy for a business to help them be export ready and then to scale up internationally. And I just want to focus on one thing in there, which is about identifying the right market, because that's absolutely key. So I would say, you know, one of the first conversations we have is about selecting and prioritizing the right international markets for your product or service. So we focus heavily on that. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what are we doing? Well, we offer, as well as the one-to-one -one advice, we, we've got, well, I would say in the usual world, we've got access to uh, international events, such as trade shows, trade missions, uh, and so on. Clearly, the last year has been a real challenge for uh, for everyone. So what we've had to try to do is to pivot to um, a virtual model, just like we're doing here today. So, for example, 
we're, um, we brought a lot of content to companies in the Southeast, including Oxfordshire, including things like virtual meet the buyers, uh, meet the experts from around the world, but also uh, virtual exhibitions and trade missions. Um, most of these are, are, are free to join, so um, please contact us for more information. Um, alongside that, we have a program of workshops and masterclasses, which are we can deliver virtually, which cover a whole range of really important subjects, such as um, you know optimizing for international trade on websites, um, pitching online, uh, managing international distributors and agents, and so on. So. Uh, we, we're, we're trying to provide as much you know, good content to companies as we can during this time. Next slide, please. Um, this was mentioned by Jill. Um, we provide um, a lot of support and access to um, e-trading platforms and international marketplaces online. Um, in many cases, the uh, Department for International Trade has negotiated preferential agreements with marketplaces um, which, you know, in some cases means discounted rates or no listing fees. So you know, it can help companies to to get uh, onboarded on these marketplaces and uh, you know get selling their brand over over various platforms into international markets. So there's a link there to find out more. Obviously, these slides will be shared with you after the presentation. Next slide, please. Um, here are some other links that you might find useful. There's one here um, on how to, it says check how to export goods, but it covers a number of things, including um, duty rates, rules of origin, um, customs and documentation requirements for um, over 160 markets around the world. Also, there's an online tariff checker, which is useful um, is, as a very quick reference tool and um, there is information about exporting services as well. Obviously, these links will be forwarded on to you, as I say. Next slide, please. As well as this, there's uh, links here to the various transition um, portals on the government website, gov.uk forward slash transition. And um, also there are some links to um, request specific support if your query is not answered um, in the detail that you need. And there is also a link to the government um, EU exit email, which you can click through to, uh, again, to direct your specific inquiries. Next slide, please. And so just wrapping up, um, these are our contact details. Um, I work in the Southeast International Trade Team. Here's the email. Um, contact email address and telephone number and some links to follow us on the various social media channels. So thank you very much. I will now pass you back to Howard. Many thanks, International Trade Advisor Angus Murray. I'm sure you'd agree that we've already covered a lot of ground with our first three speakers. We've heard about the help that Oxlet Business can offer SMEs in the county, the wide-ranging support from Newable plus the government's intentions to help realize the new possibilities for businesses that are now achievable under the stewardship of the Department for International Trade. If you want to ask a question or make a specific point, then please use the question panel in the control area of this platform. Our Q&A section will be at the end of this broadcast. In the next part of this virtual event, we're going to focus on the considerations needed with regard to VAT when trading with the European Union. As I'm sure you'll appreciate, this is a wide-ranging and complex area. With the help of our next guest, we'll hopefully shine some light on how matters of taxation will look in context going forward. One of the big questions business people have been asking is how would the UK's exit affect tariffs, taxes and trading in Europe? There are so many aspects to this. What are my obligations? How do I register? Are there any rule variations in different member states? The list goes on. Our final speaker is the Global Project Manager at Simply VAT. Her extensive knowledge of the industry and passion for empowering businesses to grow globally has made her an active member of the e-commerce community. She's previously spoken at conferences across Europe, helping sellers to understand the ever-changing online market and the vital role VAT compliance plays in sustainable expansion. 
with an overview on VAT considerations since the UK left the EU. Here's Alex Wyatt. Hi everyone. Thanks so much uh, for having me today. Um, I'm super excited to be here. So today I'm going to be covering off um, a few different things. First of all, we're going to look at the latest updates for UK businesses post transition period. So looking specifically today at um, trading physical goods B2C and uh, trading physical goods B2B. Now, if you do have any questions surrounding any um, digital services you might provide, I can answer questions on that at the end as well. Um, and then I'm going to jump into the changes coming up in July, um, which is going to be covering off the whole of the EU VAT reform, specifically coming in labeled as the e-commerce package. Um, and then I'll jump into some questions and happy to answer any that you might have today. So working with the EU post-transition period, we're going to start with B2C cross-border supplies. So um, if you were trading cross-border B2C, holding your stock here in the UK, in the UK trading cross-border into uh, Europe, you would have been um, covered under the freedom of movement of goods, and you would have also um, been able to use what's called the distant selling rules. And these distant selling rules were where your goods were held here in the UK, you could sell cross-border up until set thresholds were exceeded. In most EU countries, they're 35,000 euros, and um, other EU countries, countries like Germany, Netherlands, and Luxembourg, uh, they were set at 100,000 euros. Now, um, these distant selling rules no longer apply between the UK and the EU. Um, because there is that hard customs border, um, as you go through um, trying to get your goods through onto mainland Europe or Ireland, for example, now, once you get your goods into Europe, if you're holding your stock in the EU warehouse, you still have access to these distant selling rules. So keep that in mind um, as we go and talk through the different models you have um, when selling into Europe, because you can still utilize these distant selling rules, which I like to say are um, you know, a great rule to help um, businesses trade cross-border, test new markets um, from, from that kind of point of view. So what happens now that we've left the EU? If you're trading in the uh, from the UK into the EU, still cross-border B2C transactions, um, it, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to choose who the importer of record of the goods are. Now, the importer of record is the person who is uh, liable to pay the customs duties and VAT upon entry into the EU. Um, typically, this can be either the customer or you, the seller, so you're going to have to choose, and I'll talk through these options in a moment. The other option, like I've just briefly mentioned, is actually moving your stock into a warehouse in mainland Europe, and um, then you'll have access to those distant selling rules again. Um, please note that if you move your goods into an EU-based uh, fulfillment centre, this will trigger a tax obligation. You will need to VAT register because you have created a taxable supply uh, in that EU country, um, and therefore you're going to have to charge the local rate of VAT of where your goods are um, being sold from. So when we're looking at B2B cross-border supplies, um, the main thing, you won't see a huge difference in terms of the VAT collected between the UK and the EU, because before the transition period, uh, you would have been using what's called the reverse charge mechanism. And the reverse charge mechanism um, is an, uh, applies to inter-community EU B2B um, transactions, and it essentially zero rates an invoice. So now, after uh, the transition period, you'll see that there's going to be no acquisition tax applying between any purchases um, happening between the UK and the EU. And this is again because when you're exporting goods from the UK, it's going to be zero rated for VAT purposes uh, here in the UK. When you're importing into the EU, now you have to figure out the import taxes. So they're kind of two separate different taxes, your sales tax and your um, import taxes. So from a B2B point of view, um, there won't be any acquisition taxes. You won't need to be charging anything. And then when the receiver imports the goods, um, that's where we're going to have to choose who the importer of record is. Is it you, the business, that's selling the goods, or is it the business that is buying the goods? 
Now, if it's you, the business that's selling the goods, you're going to need a VAT registration in the country that you're importing into. So if you're selling B2B um, cross-border into the EU, then it's highly uh, recommended that you, you, you make the um, end EU-based business um, the importer of record. And what this will do is means that they have to pay the import VAT and duties. However, they will also be able to reclaim the import VAT on their local VAT return. So for them um, receiving the products, the main difference is going to be kind of a cash flow thing um, as well as any duties that might apply to the goods going into, um, into the EU country. Um, so when if you the seller are going to act as the importer of record um what's going to happen is if you move your goods into the eu or even if you're selling say from a fulfillment center in the eu for example um we have uh you can still utilize the reverse charge mechanism so this is for any cross-border intra-eu b2b supplies um, and you can use that reverse charge mechanism when goods are going cross-border Otherwise, um, any local EU B2B sales um, from the domestic reverse uh, would apply to um, any local, sorry, any local EU B2B sales. You, um, it depends on the individual country. So some countries have um, a domestic reverse charge, meaning uh, so if you're selling goods from France to a, cust a business customer in France, you would not be charging um, any uh, VAT because they have that domestic reverse charge. Whereas some countries like Ireland, if you're uh, holding your stock in Ireland, selling to a VAT registered business in Ireland, you would have to charge VAT much like you do here um, in the UK when you are uh, have a domestic B2B um, supply. So it really just depends on which countries you're importing into, exporting into, um, and where the end customer is as well. Um, now, some of you may be using Amazon's fulfillment network, and uh, you know, if you are, that's fantastic. There have been a few changes that I would want to make you aware of, um, so that uh, you can make sure that you're utilizing this to the best of um, your ability. So the first thing is, is that Amazon has been really clear that under the Pan EU package, which is a, um, a, a fulfillment option where you imported your goods into the UK and then Amazon would move your uh, goods across uh, six other countries um, and based on an algorithm so that your goods would be able to move closer to the end individual. Now, um, Amazon is no longer shipping goods between the UK and mainland Europe. So if you are um, selling goods through the Pan-EU system, you're going to have to import goods into your UK fulfillment centers here, as well as import directly into an EU fulfillment center, at which point Amazon will pick up the goods and move them around from there. Um, if you are selling on um, Amazon specifically, they have requested that you do send your goods DDP if sending uh, if you're selling cross border, and that typically means that you the customer or you the seller sorry are uh, paying the import VAT upon importation, um, and which gives a better customer experience as the end customer doesn't have that extra kind of fee um, as the goods cross through customs. Um, any low value consignment relief goods. So these are goods with a, a consignment value of less than 22 euros um, going into the EU can be delivered DAP. So it kind of contradicts what they um, have said with all the goods going in DDP. But the reason for this is because any low value consignment relief goods going into um, Europe uh, are actually exempt of having to pay any import VAT. So this is um, quite massive, meaning that what you can do is you can import your goods DAP, uh, meaning the customer is the importer of record, but there won't be any additional VAT obligations for the customer because it's under that low value consignment relief threshold. Now these thresholds vary from country to country. Um, it's typically set at about 22 euros, um, but it can vary in some countries they don't have it, like France recently have um, taken it away. Um, and um, some countries have a, a slightly um, lowered rate depending on their kind of fluctuations into their currency as well, into their local currency. And the other thing I want to raise is the VAT responsibility column um, in the VAT transaction report. So as a, as a um, VAT um, uh, company, we look at the VAT transaction report from Amazon. And um, when we do this, we'll look at um, who is actually going to be responsible for the 
goods and collecting the VAT. Um, due to the recent changes here in the UK from overseas goods, um, marketplaces are liable to collect specific uh, sales of VAT. So in this case, um, Amazon has reflected this in their VAT transaction report where they're going to be stating actually who's responsible to pay this, these taxes. And now this isn't just an Amazon thing, this is all marketplaces here in the UK are now liable to collect VAT in certain cases. So I'm going to touch on Paul on this in just a moment. But just keep this in mind if you are utilizing um, the different uh, Department for International Trade activities um, or, or um, help when you go onto a marketplace that they are now kind of uh, taking on this responsibility. And what you will have to do is just add in the VAT into the gross price you list your products on the marketplace. So, um, like I kind of mentioned, these these new rules that have come into play. So they're getting rid of, or they got rid of the low value consignment relief threshold here in the UK. So that 22 euros I said uh, I spoke about earlier, um, we had it here in the UK. Any goods being imported into the UK with a consignment value of less than 15 pounds was relieved of import VAT. So that was abolished as of the 1st of January this year, and instead. Um, they've replaced it with this new threshold of 135 pounds. Everything coming in to the UK um, is going to be charged with VAT now. There's no um, low value consignment relief, um, but what it does mean is that anything less than 135 pounds coming here going directly into the UK so this is for any drop shippers maybe um, anybody that's importing goods directly to customers here in the UK um, you will have to pay, uh, sorry charge VAT at the point of sale and then um, you will then pay that over to the tax authorities on your UK VAT return but your goods will be able to go through customs without any import VAT so this is a major change for a lot of businesses um, if you're, you'll be attaching your um, commercial invoice but you won't have to pay any import taxes um, as the goods go through customs if the um, value of the consignment is greater than 135 pounds, you're going to go through normal customs procedure. So this is where um, you still have duties to pay upon importation into the UK, um, and you'll also have to pay import VAT upon importation into the UK, even if it's going directly to an end customer. And the reason why I'm kind of talking about these rules is because uh, the EU VAT reform that's happening as of July are going to heavily reflect this, and I'll touch upon this, like I said, at the end of the presentation. But just keep this in mind: these these two different or this one threshold applying two different uh, rules uh, upon importation. So going back into um, how you as an e-commerce seller, or you know, even selling cross-border um, B to C specifically in this model, um, how can you trade? So I've put up three different models here, um, and these aren't the only three models, but these are the uh, most widely used models when importing into the EU. So the first one is you, the seller, are paying the import VAT. Um, you're going to be responsible for any of those import VAT duties and charges. Um, it's going to be a better customer experience as your goods are going to be able to go straight through um, customs without having, you know, without getting stopped um, and having to ask the customer for the end uh, or for the uh, import VAT um, or any extra handling charges. Um, but a big thing to note, again, those distant selling thresholds no longer apply. If you are importing in um, as the importer of record, you will need um, an EORI number where you're importing into, um, and this will assign you as the importer of record. And you'll also need um, a local VAT registration where you're importing your goods into. Um, this is because, oh, bear with me. So you're going to need a local um, VAT registration where you're importing into, and this is because you're creating a taxable supply 
when the goods are moving into an EU country. Um, and with doing that, uh, you're uh, seen as moving your goods in to the EU as the importer of record, you're owning the goods, and then you're creating a, a, a transaction once the goods are already in the EU. So you're going to um, VAT register in the country you're importing into, you are going to get your EORI number to allot your EORI um, to the um, import documentation to assign you as the importer, which allows you to reclaim your import VAT. And then you're going to be able to sell cross-border from there once the goods are imported, but charging the local rate of VAT where you're importing into. So the second model here is that the customer is the importer of record. And so this um, is typically used with the, um, the ENCO term DAP. Um, and this is the least burdensome option for you as the seller, but it's the most burdensome option for the customer. And that's because the goods get stuck at customs, uh, they'll get a letter saying that they owe um, the import taxes and then any handling fees. Um, and if they don't pay that, then the goods come back to you and they're returned. So this is a negative customer experience. Um, so it, it's something to consider as a seller as you start create, uh, trading cross-border. Cross from the here in the UK. Like I mentioned um, earlier, if you are selling low value goods into the UK, and that's again a consignment value worth less than 22 euros, um, you can use uh, the customer as the importer of record and them not have any extra um, additional import taxes to pay. So if you do have those low value goods, maybe that is model two is a good option uh, for you to, to sell cross border. And then under model three here, we're talking about holding stock in an EU country. So this could be again through an Amazon fulfillment center. Uh, it can be through a 3PL in, in Europe, um, but it's moving inventory into a European fulfillment center in order to make um, cross-border supplies from there. Um, so you will need that local VAT registration um, in order to, to import your goods into the EU and to sell goods from there. And you're going to be charging the local rate of VAT where your, where your, um, where your goods are being sold from. So in practice, again, just driving um, this home, these three different models home. So if you're a UK-based business right now, selling all your goods from a UK warehouse, you have three different options. Model one is you're going to continue to ship from the UK. You're going to act as the importer of record. Um, you're going to VAT register where you're at the importer of record. You're going to charge the local rate of VAT on sales, and you're going to reclaim the import VAT on your VAT returns. So you're not getting charged VAT twice. Um, you can always reclaim your import VAT wherever you're VAT registered. Model two, is you are going to continue to ship to, um, from the UK. You're going to make the customers the importer of record and pay the import VAT, and there's going to be no additional VAT obligations for you um, under this model. And model three here is you're going to move goods into an EU based warehouse. You're going to VAT register where you're holding your stock, and you're going to be able to use the distant selling thresholds. Um, I just want to take a moment to pause here and I just want to reflect on the first model one and two um, and this is because I've seen a lot of couriers um, you know operating with different inco terms meaning different um, importer of records and I wanted to touch upon the reason why I haven't listed um, this means DDP and this means DAP is because the couriers have um, post transition period, um, they have come up with different options in order to get your goods into uh, the EU, which is fantastic. So um, the reason why I really want to drive home who the importer of record is, is because they label DDP, meaning um, sometimes you're paying the import taxes, but the customer is the importer of record, um, or they call it DAP and you, the seller, are paying the taxes. So um, I really just want to drive that home is that we're looking at who the importer of record is here. Um, not necessarily um, who's paying the taxes um, and, and although this is confusing some companies have offered um, what they're calling an enhanced DAP service where you the seller are importing your goods um, and paying the taxes but the customer is the importer of record so as the customer is the importer of record this means that even though you the business are paying the import taxes you um, you don't have any additional VAT obligations other than paying that import tax you don't have to VAT register in a uh, mainland EU country so just keep that in mind that we're looking at who the importer of record is, not necessarily um, 
who's paying the taxes or who uh, which Inco term you're using because so many different couriers have offered um, so many different options um, post transition that we've seen. If you want any clarification on that, please post your question too. I'm happy to go through that. Um, so will you need a fiscal representative? So I like to um, talk about this because it's a brand new topic to UK-based businesses. Um, fiscal representatives are local um, EU-based businesses or people who are jointly and severally liable for VAT owed by a non-EU-based business. And this is completely new, obviously, to um, UK-based businesses because before the transition period, um, we were able to VAT register wherever and whichever EU country without a fiscal representative but now we've moved into this um, you know third country space uh, you may need this fiscal representative when trying to get that registered in an EU country now each of the individual countries have their own rules and regulations around this so um, it depends on the country that you're trying to VAT register in. For example, um, France. France is not requiring UK-based UK businesses to have a fiscal representative. However, they do require um, US-based businesses to have a fiscal representative. So it really comes down to the individual country. Now, Belgium um, is another one. They're kind of um, still making up their mind on how they want to tra treat UK-based businesses. However, if you did need a, a fiscal representative in Belgium, you would need to put a bank guarantee in place with the Belgian tax authorities. Um, and this would be negotiated as your VAT registering in Belgium. So it really depends on the individual country you're trying to get VAT registered in. Um, but keep in mind, as if, if you do need a fiscal representative in specific EU countries, that there may be extra fees associated or bank guarantees, um, and this is to kind of cover that joint risk um, of being jointly liable for the, the VAT owed by your business. So you can um, make sure that you are setting those extra costs into your um, cash flow or into your, um, your overheads as a normal kind of cost to your business, because it is going to be um, required in specific situations. So moving on to EORI numbers. Um, so EORI stands for Economic Operator Registration and Identification Number. And this number is used on your import and export documents. Um, and it's to identify you as the importer of record. So um, right now you probably have a GB EORI number if you were um, importing and exporting from the UK uh, pre and post post uh, transition period. Um, however, that GB EORI number will no longer work when trying to import your goods into an EU country. You'll need it um, in order to export your goods from the UK, but you will no longer be able to import into the EU with that GB EORI number. So um, you would need to, if you are going to be the importer of record, you would need to get a secondary EORI number in an EU country. Now, the customs authorities across the EU have stated that you should um, get an EU EORI number in the first port of entry that you're importing into. Um, however, you know, we spoke to the customs authorities and they said that, they, that it's really difficult to check. Um, so if you don't know which country that you first imported into or um, you don't know which one, if, you're, uh, if you have multiple ports of entry, then um, you can choose one. Um, from experience, we know that Netherlands and France are issuing them quite quickly, and um, if you're importing into Germany, Germany is no longer issuing um, EU ORI numbers to UK-based businesses or any non-EU-based um, businesses, as you'll need to use um, what's called an indirect representative when trying to import into Germany. So we put together a little checklist for moving um, your goods into the EU and these slides will be available so you can kind of have a little checklist um, when you're preparing your shipments over. Um, but a few things I just wanted to kind of um, touch upon is looking at, first of all, reviewing your supply chain um, because this may have changed now. If you were manufacturing in the EU and you're sending goods over to the UK and then back into the EU, you may be charged with extra duties or, um, or VAT twice it could be uh, something you know a problem for cash flow or another option maybe is if you were importing say from China into the UK and then moving goods again into Europe um, you're going to be again charged twice um, upon importing into the two different um, member states or into the two different countries 
So um, keep that in mind and review your supply chain. See, I, you know, maybe the best option for your business is just to import directly into the UK and directly into Europe, or maybe um, using a bonded warehouse here in the UK. I would suggest reviewing that and make sure you can kind of save on all those extra little costs um, because, you know, costs have uh, started to go up in terms of um, anything to do with kind of Brexit uh, post transition period shipping. Um, the other one I want to touch upon is um, your um, postponed accounting. If you're importing any goods into the UK, you can use what's called postponed accounting. Um, and what that means is that you're importing into the UK and you actually don't need to pay any import VAT upon importation. As long as you're VAT registered here in the UK, you'll just account for it in your UK VAT return um, as an input and output. So you speak to your freight forwarders, whoever you're using to import your goods into the UK, um, because this could be, really help your cash flow instead of having to wait until the next quarter to, to reclaim your um, import VAT, you might not have to pay it at all. So have a look into that, speak to your freight forwarder um, if you can use something like this. You don't even have to apply for it um, as long as you're UK VAT registered, you can utilize it. The other thing is plan for delays and communicate those delays as well. Um, if you are selling to businesses or customers cross-border and you know that there's going to be a delay going through customs um, or you know that they're going to have to pay the import taxes upon importation, make sure you're over communicating these sorts of things um, on your website, on your communication, on your uh, checkout process, wherever you can. Make sure you're over communicating and setting the expectations of your end customers um, so that they are, are very well aware of what's happening with their goods. Okay, so touching upon um, the EU VAT reform. So this is a quite exciting one um, that's coming up. And I say exciting because I'm managing the project and I'm really excited about all, all the changes that are happening. Um, the, the, the VAT legislation was created 40 years ago. So it had nothing really um, set in stone for um, you know this whole uh, e-commerce kind of revolution. So now they're trying to catch up and trying to make sure that they're eliminating VAT fraud um, equally out the playing field for local EU-based businesses um, and so they're implementing these changes to make sure that they're capturing VAT um, at every point that they possibly can. So the first big change um, is going to be that electronic interfaces, so mainly marketplaces, are going to be um, liable to collect VAT in specific cases um, uh, at the point of sale. So this would be for any sales made by a um, non-EU-based business um, from goods in, based in the EU. So if you're using AM Fulfillment Center, Amazon would have to collect that VAT on your behalf. Um, the other option is if um, you're importing goods with a consignment value of less than 150 euros, again, a marketplace is going to be liable to collect this VAT. So that's kind of big changes um, for, for if you're selling on a marketplace. Next is the extension of MOSS into OSS. So MOSS stands for the mini one-stop shop um, and it is for, right now it's for digital services, um, any downloadable products. Um, it's mainly for telecommunications, broadcasting and electronic services. So they're extending this MOSS scheme into the OSS scheme, which stands for one-stop shop to include physical goods as well. And what it means is that you only, if you're holding stock in an EU country, You'll only need one additional um, OS registration um, in order to, uh, to record any of your cross-border B2C transactions. So any cross-border B2C transactions will be um, going on to this one OS report where you're holding your stock and you're going to be paying, collecting VAT at the point of sale um, from the country of uh, where your end customers are based. So if you're um, if your customer is in Sweden, you'll be charging 25%. If your customer is in Germany, you'll be charging 19%. You're going to take all that money and you're going to put it on one OS return and you're going to file it to one tax, uh, tax authority on a quarterly basis. And um, you're going to pay over the ta uh, all the VAT collected and the tax authorities are going to split that amongst themselves. So this is a huge simplification um, because it's getting rid of those distant selling thresholds well, that I mentioned earlier where you're selling cross border up until set thresholds, wh which point you'd have to VAT register in each of these individual countries once you cross over the thresholds. They're replacing it with just one simplified um, report uh, that you have have to file to one tax authority and therefore they would then split the money amongst themselves.
So this is a huge simplification for any goods that are stored in the EU. You're still going to need a local VAT registration where your stock is held, and in that local registration, um, you're going to account for any cross-border B2B transactions, because the um, OSS is only for B2C. Um, you're also going to be able to reclaim any import VAT through your local VAT return, and any domestic sales as well um, will have to go on your local VAT return. OSS is only for cross-border sales of goods. Um, Next is the import one-stop shop scheme. So this is a second scheme that's going to be introduced and the import one-stop shop scheme is for consignments of less than 150 euros in value. And much like the rules that they've implemented here in the UK, anything um, with the consignment value less than 150 euros will be able to go through um, without having any import VAT charged because you're going to be charging VAT at the point of sale based on where the end customer is. Once the goods go through customs, the, the, it will, uh, there's no import duties charged either because the threshold for import duties is 150 euros as well. Anything above 150 euros is going to go through normal customs procedures. And when I say normal customs procedures, I mean um, you're going to be charged with import VAT and import duties upon the goods clearing through customs. Um, and you can choose who the importer of record is at that point in time. And this IOS scheme is actually replacing the low value consignment relief threshold. Um, so again, if you're using or if you're selling any um, low value goods of less than 22 euros at the moment, that will only be able to be used up until um, the 30th of June, um, at which point you're going to transition over to the IOS scheme and you will then um, be recording it on this one IOS report. Um, you can register with the IOS in one EU country and uh, you're going to pay um, over to one EU country on a monthly basis um, and it's going to be any VAT collected at the point of sale. So again, a huge simplification coming for any imported goods with a consignment value less than 150 euros. Um, and just to note that these are all optional schemes. So if you don't want to use the IOS scheme, you could choose to VAT register in each country that you import into, which is obviously a lot more um, you know, costly for your business. Or you could um, make the customer the importer of record, but you'd have to pay the taxes. That wouldn't be reclaimable. Same thing with the OS scheme. If you didn't want to use the OS scheme, um, you would have to VAT register in each country where you're selling your goods um, to a customer. So keep that in mind um, that these are optional, but they are also useful. I think I want to hammer home is really that simplifications are coming, but you do need to comply now. So if you are cross border uh, selling cross border at the moment, you will need to also make sure that you are complying at this second. So even if you cross over a distant selling threshold on the 28th of June, you'd still need to VAT register um, in that EU country and have to uh, comply in that local country. So um, make sure that if you uh, are having questions about your um, existing VAT obligations, you can speak to ourselves or another tax advisor and to make sure that you're complying right at this moment. That is it for me. I kind of covered off a lot, so I'm happy to answer any questions that may have come through. Um, or additionally, you can take down my email and I'm happy to, to help answer any specific questions um, you might have or that might pop up as you continue to trade into the EU. Great stuff. Uh, thank you. Simply VAT's Alexandra Wyatt. Nice to hear someone excited about VAT. Uh, in fact, the contribution from all of our guest speakers today has been first class, as I'm sure you'd agree. And you've been really busy too, posing your questions and posting your comments for our panel to answer. Oxleps communications manager Rob Panting has been collating your comments. Rob, uh, you've uh, got a few questions there, for, particularly for Alex, I believe. <coughs> Yes, yeah, thanks, Howard. Thanks, Alex, as well for the uh, for the insight. Um, <clears throat> yeah, quite a few questions coming through from from our delegates uh, this morning. So thank you for for contributing. We'll try and cover off as 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 many as we can. Um, <clears throat> some of which may have been covered in the initial presentation. So I've tried to keep tabs on on those, Alex, just to give you a, a heads up as they come through. But some new ones too. Um, the first one I think we did cover off, but it's probably just worth um, seeking some some clarification. Um, 
will all UK companies need to register for VAT in the EU, even if uh, stock is placed in the country of sales? So um, at the moment, we're talking about, at the moment, you only need to um, VAT register if you are acting as the importer of record and you'll have to VAT register in the country of importation. And secondly, um, if you're holding stock in an EU country for onward sale to customers, then you will also need um, a VAT registration in that EU country. So there's really only kind of two um, instances where you're going to need that local VAT registration, whether you're importing as the importer of record um, or uh, if you're holding stock in an EU country. Excellent, thank you. I think the further questions, I, I, I'm not sure whether we did uh, cover also, hopefully they're, they're new questions to um, uh, to test you. Um, uh, so the next one is around um, VAT thresholds. So do VAT thresholds also include uh, shipping costs with any uh, any particular movement? Um, so this is a it's a great question. So for the um, uh, for the consignment value thresholds, um, when we're looking at any consignments going in, when I whenever I talked about consignments, whether that's going into the UK with 135 pounds or um, the 150 coming up going forward, or even the low value consignment relief threshold, um, this is where it, shipping is not included if. Um, it's not included in the price. So um, if you are shipping goods into um, the EU um, with a consignment value, say, of £135, and shipping on top of that is, say, um, on another £20, 20 pounds, for example, then that wouldn't be included. Now, if you, you um, have listed on your website free shipping and you've included the shipping in your price, then in that case, shipping is included in the consignment value. So it just depends on how you've listed your, your um, product prices um, because that would then kind of uh, change up how, how those, uh, th those are calculated. Um, so if you've excluded the shipping, it's excluded. If you've included the shipping in the price, it's included into the consignment values. Excellent. Thanks for the clarification. Um, this one looks at, I think, the way that businesses are set up in terms of the representation that they have in the in the European Union. So um, this question says, my business previously benefited from having a customs agent in place in the EU. Uh, would this be worth considering again if I'm not familiar with the import processes? I mean, I guess probably that's a, an individual business decision to make, but I don't know whether you can um, give any insight in, in terms of how that might work. Yeah, absolutely. So the customs um, agents are are typically, you know, the what we call the indirect representatives or the direct representatives. Um, now it depends on the country and I'm, i mean we don't deal typically with customs um, as a vat agency but we do we have seen and heard from our clients that are right now trading into the eu um, and like i mentioned earlier going into germany right now has been a huge difficulty for uk-based businesses what would have been so easy before the transition period has now been super super complex where people are getting their goods stuck at customs um, and german cust uh, customs authorities are actually requiring this indirect representative um, which would be a customs agent, for example. Now, finding them can sometimes be tricky, um, especially in Germany. We found it really tricky. Um, but you can, you know, I do know that there's others, uh, you know, you can use customs representatives um, in different countries as well to import into, um, to act as the importer of record. But if you do use them as the importer of record, um, and, you know, typically they are the ones paying over the import VAT, meaning that you wouldn't be able to to reclaim that tax. So keep that in mind if you are um, importing in with a customs representative, um, typically they pay, well, even though you pay it over to them, um, you won't be able to reclaim that, that import tax under their name. Um, but yeah, that's kind of from our experience. Germany, you definitely need one. Um, and it's really tricky to get into to Germany at the moment. Just a big heads up. So I'd, I would, um, if you are trying to get your goods into maybe a fulfillment center in Germany, try routing them through another EU country um, instead. Great. Thanks, Alex. Um, I guess uh, you mentioned uh, uh, reclaiming VAT in, in that last answer. So it follows on uh, that, that particular theme. Um, as a UK-based business, can my company still make refund applications for VAT that was incurred in the EU during 2020? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you want to uh, recover any VAT, if you're if you're eligible for this, um, then you will be able to use what's called the 13th directive. Um, so there was the 8th directive for EU based businesses. But now um, as a non EU based business, uh, you would have to use the 13th directive, um, which just means that uh, for any VAT recovery, which means you just need more proof um, you need there's more kind of legwork involved and i would highly advise um speaking to you know some sort of um that recovery agent in order to help you use the 13th directive um we don't do it ourselves but it's something that is quite complex um going under the 13th directive um the eighth directive would have been a lot easier so if you are are looking to use something like this then yeah please speak to to a tax agent who can help you um but it is doable you can recover it and you can recover some of the the um import charges uh, if you are eligible again, but it, had, it would have to go through the 13th directive if you're not VAT registered in the EU country. Excellent, Thank, thanks Alex. Um, <clears throat> moving on to, uh, again, I think this is, has been covered off in parts during your, your presentation, some of the previous presentations too, um, and, I, and I guess it's quite subjective, but it might be worth just sort of summarizing thoughts. Um, so, so the question is speaking generally, what are the pros and what are the cons of holding stock in the EU? Okay, that's a good question. Um, so I would say the pros at the moment are you'd able you'd be able to use um, the distance selling rules, and I think I I find them they're my favorite tax rule, which is so sad. Um, but it's because you can even you, you're able to test the different markets with only having one VAT obligation. So you're just importing your goods into one EU country. You're getting your clearing your goods all at once instead of having to lodge multiple. Um, customs declarations for each of your individual goods going through customs. Once you get your goods into a, a 3PL or fulfillment center there, um, you can sell cross-border, charging the local rate of VAT, and um, you kind of know where you sit. Whereas with the individual goods, you have to um, kind of the cons to not holding your stock is you'd have to, um, like I said, lodge individual customs declarations. There could be extra kind of higher shipping costs in order to clear your goods through customs these days. There's going to be extra delays in order to get your goods through customs. So there, uh, you know, you kind of have to weigh up what is best for your business. On the, on the flip side, things are changing in, you know, three and a half months now. So, um, and, and you'll be able to use these IOS schemes if you're selling low value goods. Um, so in that case, um, you know, if, if it's just three and a half more months of waiting, then um, maybe you want to continue to to sell direct to co uh, consumers from here in the UK um, and make your customers the importer of record or use one of these new INCO terms, the EDAPs, for example. I think the cons to to holding your stock in an EU country um, would mean that what would could, um, could probably be, you know, maybe if you're importing goods into an EU country, um, you you might need a fiscal representative depending on the country. Um, secondly, if you have a wide range of inventory, lo loads of different SKUs, for example, and you have maybe only a few products in each individual SKU. What we've heard from our clients is that you know they don't they don't want to have to split up that inventory to stop servicing the UK customer. If a UK customer wanted a size medium and navy of a sweater, then they would um, and that that inventory was over in the EU, then that would be a problem trying to get the goods back over to the UK. So if you have multiple variations of SKUs, um, in that case, I can see that being a, a con um, to holding your inventory because your stock is now um, you know split up. Um, but if you have maybe a few SKUs um, and a few, you know, uh, loads of inventory to, to be able to be split between the UK and the EU, then 100% I would I would recommend um, that as an option. But it really depends on your business and, and what um, is best for you going forward. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right in, in terms of individual businesses and the way they operate. Obviously, they need to find some specific advice to um, to make a, uh, an informed decision. But hopefully that, that information will help our uh, delegates this morning. Um, a few more questions have, have come in, which is which is good news. Um, this one is around uh, invoicing. So uh, the question is, when issuing an invoice to an EU company, does my business need to account for any VAT relating to a consultancy or brokerage service provided? 
Mm, no, it's highly unlikely. I would like to see the invoice and who you're trying to invoice um, for, for what services. Um, so yeah, well, you're welcome to send me the, the copy of the invoice. Um, but for services that are happening, um, you know, between the different EU countries, it's typically the local service VAT that would apply or, you know, if again, if goods are moving, you could be outside the scope of um, UK VAT. So if it's a consulting service, for example, um, and you're issuing an invoice to an EU based business and the um, yeah, you wouldn't have to charge any VAT because you would be charging uh, because uh, there's human interaction that's happening here in the UK. Um, you would you should technically the the UK VAT rules apply, and in that case there wouldn't be any um, VAT because it's an export of services, um, so you wouldn't have to charge any VAT. But it would depend on where the end customer is, um, and yeah, what kind of what kind of other services that you're providing um, as well. So, but that's kind of the general rule is for any live services with human interaction, it's based on where the, the, the VAT rules of where the service is happening and taking place. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, uh, a few more uh, questions. Um, so this one relates to uh, services provided to the EU. So the question is, um, do the EU VAT processes in rule, uh, and rules so I'll start start that again. Do the EU VAT processes and rules apply to services provided to the EU? I think it was probably covered in your presentation, Alex, but maybe some clarification in terms of how that that particular side uh, uh, operates. Yeah, I would again, I would again question what the services are. So some services and and where the business is and where where your business is and are you VAT registered and all of these different things would come in and play a different kind of um you know they it, it's so nitty gritty sometimes in the VAT world. So I would I would probably want to speak to you directly about this question, um but it would depend on on what services are being provided. Um, I kind of want to leave it at that, if that's okay for the services Absolutely. side. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's worth reiterating as well to to delegates that, as as our speakers have said earlier on, you know, we're very very keen to ensure that businesses engage with us, so we can we can ensure that there's some more um, detailed follow up to to these queries. I guess this is just top line information at the moment, so hopefully of value to uh, to everyone. Uh, a couple more questions have um, have come in. Um, this one relates to um, uh, clarification on how the reverse charge mechanism will now operate. So um, I'm not sure if you're able to give a, a little overview on that, Alex, please. Sure. So the reverse charge mechanism between the UK and the EU um, obviously no longer applies. So what will happen um, is everything seen as an export of goods. So let's say um, you're selling, for example, to a business um, in the in the EU. And what will happen now is you are no longer going to use the reverse charge mechanism, which was really just you're zero rating your invoice and you're adding the little obligatory phrase on the invoice saying it's an intercommunity distant sale of goods or whatever it was. Now what you're going to be doing is you're just zero rating the invoice because it's an export um, here from the UK. And then what will happen from the business customer's point of view is that they're going to be in their local VAT return under their purchases. They're going to add that as an input and output. So it um, again, the VAT kind of, it's the same thing as the reverse charge mechanism, but just without the reverse charge like um, phrase happening. And what you're doing as a UK company now is you're charging zero um, VAT, and that's going to be put in your UK VAT return as an export of goods rather than an intercommunity supply. Um, and again, if you're receiving it, um, so if you're purchasing from a, a VAT registered business in the EU, they're going to be zero rating the invoice for because it's an export from the EU. And then upon importation, um, you might someone's going to have to pay import VAT, but on your local VAT return, you'll put it as an input and output, um, and you won't you won't have to you know account for any extra VAT on that those purchases. So um, it, essentially the reverse charge mechanism just kind of cancels out the requirement to to pay the VAT um, because as a VAT registered business you're always able to reclaim any VAT on any purchases um, or imports. So um, it's just essentially eliminating out the requirement to pay it over to the tax authorities and then reclaim it. Um, so that's exactly what, what's going to happen now. 
Excellent. Thanks, Alex. Um, we have one final question, and I think we've probably given our delegates a, an extra five or ten minutes back to their day, which is uh, which is good news. Um, so one final question. This this is specifically on uh, online subscription uh, aspects. So is there VAT on selling via web online uh, subscription or online education courses that have no physical element? Yep, good question. So this, um, sorry, I didn't cover this in my presentation. However, it is um, covered under the MOSS scheme, the mini one-stop shop. So it, anything that is downloadable, that's a SaaS product, anything like that where there's no human interaction. So keep that in mind, especially because you that caveat with the educational courses. If it's all pre-recorded and somebody logs in and they and they go and pay a subscription for their course, um, that would be covered under MOSS. And um, here in the UK, you would if you were signed up to MOSS already um, pre-transition, um, the MOSS scheme is only obviously for EU, um, for the EU. So you would be recording all of those um, UK sales here in the UK on your local UK return, no longer on MOSS. Now um, you would, if you were selling to any EU-based B2C customers, so anybody without a VAT registered business, um, you would then be charging, or you, you should VAT, uh, VAT MOSS register in an EU country. Um, it could be Ireland, for example, and they speak English, so it might be the easiest country. Um, and then you would then be charging the local rate of VAT where the end customer is in the EU, and then recording that on your MOSS um, report on a quarterly basis um, to the specific tax authority where you are MOSS registered. Um, but I would recommend if you already have been selling these courses or downloads, um, for the last two months. Um, you should technically have been registered from the 10th day of the um, following month of when you had your first sale. So if you have already started selling these products or downloads, then you should um, you should get MOSS registered as soon as possible um, and then start to, to file your MOSS return there in the UK and then any UK sales would go on your local UK return. So you're kind of having two separate obligations now between the EU and the UK. I hope that helps. Perfect. Thanks, Alex. Um, so that's all the questions for everyone. There's some, there's some very nice comments in terms of your, your input, Alex, and, the, uh, and your expertise provided. So uh, I think uh, everyone who's, uh, who's asked a question has been uh, thoroughly pleased with the response that they've, they've received from you. Um, which is um, which is much appreciated. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, um, we'll certainly look to follow up those uh, specific questions that perhaps need more detail as required. But um, but from me, that's uh, that's all of the questions for now. So back over to you, Howard. Thanks. Yeah, we've learned absolutely masses there, including uh, Alex has a, a favourite tax. Who knew? Uh, <laughs> thanks for all the questions, everybody. <laughs> they're, they're much appreciated. And if there are any points that need further correspondence, then the team at Oxlep or Newable will be back in touch with you. Thanks to Rob Panting for putting your points to Alex. We must say a huge thank you to our experts. Sebastian Johnson, Head of Innovation and Inward Investment at Oxlep. Jill Carr, EU Transition Advisor at Newable. Angus Murray, International Trade Advisor at Newable, and Alexandra Wyatt, Global Project Manager at Simply VAT. Over the past 12 months, Oxlep has introduced a number of new and effective programmes and funds created to provide critical support. This provision has allowed our business community to become more agile and flexible, whilst also encouraging greater levels of business diversification. Oxlep Business is offering companies in Oxfordshire a tailored support service from experienced business advisors. Within this support, there's free one-to-one -one advice, answers to your specific post-EU transition questions, a review on the impact these changes may have on your business, and help to develop an action plan. If you want to book a meeting, then visit oxfordshirelep.com forward slash UK dash transition for more details. The UK's exit from the EU is a quantum shift in the business landscape, and arguably the biggest one in a generation. It is happening, of course, in the middle of a global pandemic that has simply changed how the world functions on a fundamental level, let alone how it does business. There are a lot of questions and uncertainty, but there is help on hand. The Department for International Trade is flying the flag and leading the way for the UK. Newable are a fabulous resource with some industry-leading experts on hand to guide you and your business. And Oxlep have genuine expertise and local knowledge in equal measure. It's a combination that will truly help you navigate the next period in this transition. 
Thank you once again for being part of this virtual event. In just a moment, a feedback survey will pop up on the screen. We'd be really grateful if you could take just a few minutes to complete it. Thank you. We've covered an enormous amount of territory over the last hour and a half or so. Your questions and contributions were very much appreciated and we'll be in touch shortly with a recording of the event and the accompanying slides. But for now, from me, Howard Bentham, goodbye.